Hello and most welcome to uh, 832. It's progressing finally here. And we have today a nice and sunny day. I hope you're all fine. And I was thinking I'll continue a little bit with uh, uh, the French philosopher and deconstructivist Jacques Derrida. And I was thinking of mentioning a little bit more in general terms about deconstruction. I think you had quite enough work when it comes to understanding the mirror effect of Rodolphe Gachet. So now I will try to make it a little bit easier on your Uh, well, first thing I need to say, even before I start, is that deconstruction doesn't lend itself to definitions. Derrida himself shied away from all definitions, bar none. And that's why, for me, Rudolf Gachet was so incredible by showing with a mirror you could have actually have a sort of a gestalt or image of the whole thing but you cannot have a definition that would sort of fly into the eyes of the project of the construction itself What we can do is compare Derrida and his work of the construction and other strands, strains in his uh, rather prolific authorship. And one thing that did a trick for me once upon a time was Arkady Plotnitsky. And he compares the undecidability in quantum mechanics with uh, the very same undecidability of the text. This can be compared with the idea of the zombie. The zombie is a rather new idea in the West. A lot because of uh, the influence from Hollywood, it has today become massly, massively influential in media, in uh, fiction, entertainment, TV series, and so forth. It is today a really big thing. And you can say about the zombie, it is a thing that is dead, yet it's alive. It's alive, yet it's dead. So just like the writing of Jacques Derrida, it seems to defy description. The zombie falls out of the definition game, so to speak. The idea of a fundamental, final, and explaining definition that could actually help with understanding as well, to make it possible for you to enter the concept of what is deconstruction, what does it mean by that. And I think there is a connection there. The, the zombie is a body without a soul. Sounds a little bit like modern man. Actually, the majority of all philosophers until rather recently all said that we were soulless bodies. That we did not have any force of movement. And that sort of lends itself to the idea that we are already zombies. 
And I think that is a challenge to the ordinary thinking of us as being alive. So it seems that the definition we are living immediately reverses itself to show that are we really living in that sense? And it's getting worse than that. It's something that is both alive and dead. And equally, it's neither alive nor dead. So in a way, it becomes worse and worse. So it doesn't have the fullness. We cannot use it in its complete and encompassing sense. We no longer have true life. And true life is what precludes death. True death. And one could say that the very zombie short circuits the usual logic of distinction. Having both states, it has neither. It belongs to a different order of things in terms of life and death. It cannot be decided. According to Hollywood, the zombie is a secret we must refuse to believe, even if it's true. No one can say that these undecidabilities are threatening. The fact threaten our normal sense of comfort and understanding. And it's also threatening the whole sense of that we are inhabiting a world of governed by decided categories. So it's no wonder that the zombie has become such a great thing to adhere to. The zombie is in itself the very terror of undecidability in between and both the things we cannot withstand. And of course we have loads of binary opposition as this positions as this thing could also be called. We have not only life and death, but we have high and low, we have true, we have false, we have right, we have left, we have west, we have east, we have male, we have female, mind, body, and the list goes on and on. And these binary positions should always obey sort of the formalization of either or and not inhabit both position at the same time. There's not enough room for both at the same time. Here we have a tendency of exclusion. It's either one or the other, cannot be both. And that's a thing not to trespass or pass over. It's more stricter than any law. Actually, it's in a way something that is before the laws, pre thought pre-establishment of anything.
because if this whole stability begins to rumble it will be like a house of cards will fall because if all this binary opposition fall binary opposition falls we will have an opening up of white slash black master servant civilized primitive and also the very thing that the zombie is stemming from that is black magic it's a thing of voodoo it starts started with voodoo and it continues to be voodoo something that is not science and there we have another of these fantastic binary oppositions between black magic or any magic miracles and science and that is a definition that is vitally important to uphold, uphold. And why not speak about the widely accepted opposition between inside and outside? What if that gets to start rolling, to get a little bit lenient, flexible? That's a terror. That means that everything can start to move. So at the same time, the zombie is fascinating, but it's also horrific. It poisons systems of order, and like all this undecidability, it should be returned to order and stay within order. It should be returned to the cemetery and given a tombstone where it says, Rest in peace. And thereby order once more will be established. It has to decide it if, if it's going to be become a proper corpse or if it will instead become a true living being. And this will be the restoration of the decidable order. That could be an ending, but there are loads of other endings, less final than this one. The zombies might be ineradicable. They might return, or perhaps undecidability is always with us. Perhaps undecidability is always with us. If not figured in the zombies, then something else. Ghosts, golems, vampires, between life and death, between male and female, and the androgen, between human and the machine. The android, between friends and enemies, the stranger.
Let's now, as usual, return to where it all started. In antiquity, in Greece, with the first strands of philosophy, with Plato, with Platon. Derrida, he detects the play of undecidability even in foundational texts of the Western tradition. Plato, who was a pupil of Socrates and founder of, a, of the Athenian Academy, writer on ethics, politics, laws and metaphysics. A marvel. One could say that Plato is an inaugural figure of Western philosophy and widely influential on later thinking. Plato himself sets the law of reason and truth against all purveyors of false wisdom, the sophist and the rhetorian. Rhetori rhetorian. Rhetorician. Rhetorious. These are people whose persuasive wordplay delude the untrained. And the poets and mythologists and storytellers who merely imitate nature or repeat without knowing. True philosophy is the active employment of reason. What does then Derrida really says, say about Plato? Well, let's go into the pharmacy. This is one of my very favorite openings getting into Derrida. I did it once upon a time in 1997, I think. I really loved it the first instance. Well, we in the pharmacy, we meet upon Phaedrus, which is a fictionalized conversation between two historical characters, Socrates and Phaedrus. Phaedrus was a young Athenian swayed by the, rhetor the rhetoricians, rhetoricians. The topic relative merit merits of the lover and the non-lover, as sexual partners and as thinker, or perhaps the topic is relative merits of rhetorics and philosophy, perhaps the merits of speech and writing. remember there is a tendency in the pharmacy to say that talking is better than writing why is that is it that writing is seemly does the right to cut out a respectable figure is it proper to write or of course not but Socrates is not going to use rational argument, myth will strike the first blow.
He used the myth coming from the e Egyptians and they had an inventor god called Toph or Thoth. He invented numbers and calculation and geometry and astronomy as well as games of draughts and dice and be all, above all he invented writing. At the time of the great god king of all upper Egypt was Thamus, the Greeks called him Amon. Toph came to him and exhibited his inventions, saying that they ought to be made known to all Egyptians. That is because the inventions will have no value whatsoever if not the god king approves of them. That's very important. He condemned some of them and he praised others. He took look way too long to go through all of them and then he came to writing itself. Maybe the greatest invention of uh, the God King Top. This branch of learning, said Toph, my lord, will make the Egyptians wiser and improve their memories. For I discovered a pharmacon, a medicine for memory and wisdom. Pharmacon is a Greek word which could be translated as magic potion. Other English translations have used the names recipe, receipt, specific, cure, remedy. But as Derda notes, pharmacon is a specially ambiguous word. In Greek, pharmacon means both cure and poison. Like the English word drug, it has good and bad aspects. Some translations revolves, resolves, the pro, uh, resolves the word, cutting out one of its poles. But the pharmacon is undecidable, inhabiting both the curative and the poison. It's problematic to say the least. Toph has offered a writing as pharmacon. Does he mean cure? Surely he wants to win his case. Writing is a remedy for deficient memory and limited vision. Wisdom. The king's reply will be incisive. The discovery of an art is not the best person to judge its harm or benefit. You, the father writing, are so fond of your offspring that you stated exactly the opposite of what it will do. Those who write will stop exercising their memory and become forgetful. They rely on the external remarks on writing instead of their internal capacity to remember things. You discovered a pharmacon for reminding, not for true memory.
As for wisdom, you offer your students a mere appearance of it, not the reality. They receive many things from you, but without proper instruction. They seem knowledgeable when they're quite ignorant, and they will be hard to get along with. When they, in fact, are quite ignorant, and they be hard to get along with, they will, they'll carry the conceit of wisdom instead of being really wise. Phaedra said, what your Theban says is quite sound, I'm sure. Like portrait paintings, writing is lifeless. It cannot answer back when you ask it a question, and writing can be banded around anywhere among those who understand and those who have no business with it. It cannot know who it ought to speak to. When it's unfairly abused, it needs his father there to support it, because it's quite incapable of helping or defending itself. Writing is condemned. Real memory will re uh, decline. True education will be corrupted. False knowledge will be replaced. Will replace true wisdom. Writing is lifeless, orphaned, and helpless. But Toff offered it as a famakan. Tamus, with all the authority of the kings of kings and gods of gods, returned it. Decided, writing is a poison. Writing as an undecidable has been returned decided. Derrida wants to keep it in play. He shows how Plato's argument depends throughout on a series of simple clear cut oppositions. God slash evil inside slash outside, true slash false, essence slash appearance, life slash death. Plato's definition of writing is inserted into this oppositions. Speech is good, writing is bad, true memory is internal, written reminding is external. Speech carries the essence of knowledge, writing only its appearance. Spoken signs are living. Written marks, lifeless. If one got to thinking that something like the Pharmacon govern these oppositions, and one would have to bend into strange contortion what could no longer simply be called logic. In Derrida's view, Writing has the characteristics that can't be decided within these oppositions. It disrupts the oppositions. It plays across good and bad, curative and injurious. There is neither simple cure nor simple poison. The characteristics of writing inhabit in interior memory while also being external. 
Living speech shares in the characteristics of dead writing. Writing refuses to settle down as mere appearance of true knowledge. And in some ways it's true that even Plato cannot avoid this. He resorts to metaphors of writing to describe true knowledge and internal memory. The only speeches that are worthy of serious attention are those that are taught and spoken for the sake of learning and actually written in the soul. Listen to that. Writing as Pharmacon cannot be fixed down within Plato's oppositions. The Pharmacon has no proper or determinate character. It is the play of possibilities. The movement movements back and forth into and out of the opposites. <laughs> and here we come to one of my real favorites, the supplement, the supplement, the supplement. Uh, once the aberrant uh, logic of the pharmacon is let loose, it poisons the fixity and the clarity of other oppositions grouped around it. For instance, Plato's argument relies on father son, Egyptian Greek, original derivation. Can we be sure of this? That's the question. In Derrida's hands, they start to unravel. He turns to the original Egyptian myth, where the characters are Toph and King Amon. Toph is the son of the sun god Amon. Here, Derrida introduces the supplement. Toph is the supplement to Amon. The French one supplement means both addition and replacement. That's important. The supplement both extends and replaces. As a dietary supplement both aids to the diet and becomes part of the diet. One could say the supplement sort of uh, obeys a very strange logic. To be in addition means to be added to something already complete. And here we have the sun going into the king. Yet it cannot be complete if it needs an addition. The king is complete and has an addition. Needing an addition, the king is not yet whole. The supplement extends by repeating. The king's son has the same blood and is the king's extension. But the supplement opposes by replacing. The king's son will assert the king, take his place. And then we come all the way down to the declaration, the king is dead, long live the king. 
And that is not some that must escape the grip of standard logic. It follows the logic of the supplement. The king must be the same but different. He is figured twice as father king and supplement king. So one could say that Toph opposes his father king, but he opposes what he himself repeats. He opposes himself. Toph, the demigod, is undecidable, and so is Toph, the Greek counterpart. So, so one could actually say that the Joker is thus the father's other, the father and himself. He cannot be assigned a fixed location in this play. Sly, slippery and masked. An intriguer and a card. He is neither king nor jack, but rather sort of a joker. A floating signifier, a wild card. One who puts play into play, and this joker is the inventor of play, of games, of drafts, dice, etc. Every act of his is marked by an unstable ambivalence. He is the god of calculation, arithmetic and rational science. He also presides over the occult sciences, astrology and alchemy. He is the god of magic formula, of secret accounts of hidden texts, and so he is the god of medicine. The god of writing is the god of pharmacon. So can Tiff simply have meant writing as a remedy? Isn't the undecidable demigod condemned to invent undecidables? Not just remedies, but pharmacons, other pharmacos. And Derrida asks, asks isn't desire for orphanhood and patrici patricidal subversion? Isn't it from a con a criminal thing? A poison gift? And here we come into the magician and the scapegoat. I really like this part. Plato's attempt to fix down father and son's original derivatives are also attempts to fix down philosophy. But philosophy itself has no easy remedies for undecidables. Derrida lakes up some related words. Pharmaceus, magician or sorcerer, is applied to Socrates himself by his accuser and enemies. Is Socrates working by enchantment? Is the sorcery of the undecidable inside philosophy inescapable part of philosophical method? And pharmacos means scapegoat. It's an evil found inside the city that must be cast out to maintain the city's purity. The scapegoat must belong to the inside, but must also belong to the outside. It is an undecidable. Writing is the undecidable pharmacos of philosophy. Found inside philosophy, Plato writes, it needs to be cast out. Plato condemns writing. And all of a sudden, we have philosophy set against itself.
Inside and outside assures us of order. On its assurance, Plato tells us what is properly inside philosophy. Derrida, Derrida's strategies on fix the order. Why, this is not standard philosophical procedure. We'd expect a refutation of Plato or a confirmation, a clear agreement or a disagreement. Or we'd expect the offer of truth or correct meanings, or some explanations of Plato's major concepts. Such readings would reproduce Plato's logic, the attempt to master undecidability. Isn't that interesting? You would do the exactly same thing. Instead of countering Plato's argument, or approving it, or modifying it, Derrida insists on its instabilities. It is inhabited at every turn by an undecidability that it cannot fully master. I think I leave it to that. I'll say thank you very much. This is first new take on Derrida as a whole, and we're looking into that you cannot ever decide what is the construction and it defies all sorts of definition. You cannot put, ca put categories on it, you cannot do anything to make it firm, fixed and stable. It is undecidability itself. I wish you a very pleasant afternoon and see you soon. Cheers.